Hi, I'm Dwayne Brown. Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition. A fire continues to rage just north of Los Angeles, forcing many people out of their homes. But the good news is Mother Nature is helping contain the situation with the powerhouse fire. The beaches, the weather, San Diego Andy is known also as ahead. Mayor Bob Filner joins us for an update on the city budget, tourism marketing district, and cleanup of the cove. Then, San Diego service members, veterans, and their families get a chance to record and preserve their stories forever. How to join the StoryCorps Military Voices Initiative. The beaches, the weather, San Diego is known as America's finest city, but is it affordable? We'll take a look at how San Diego stacks up with the rest of the nation. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs. And by Hi, good evening. Thanks for joining us. Nearly 3,000 people are being allowed to return home tonight near Los Angeles after cooler weather helped fire crews knock down a stubborn wildfire. It's charred nearly 30,000 acres in the Angeles uh, National Forest just north of Los Angeles. The powerhouse fire is about 40 percent surrounded tonight and could burn another week before it's fully contained. Fifteen homes were damaged. Six were completely destroyed. With more than 1,000 structures threatened, the fire started Thursday and there's no word yet on how it was sparked. As the future of San Onofre hangs in the balance tonight, a public seminar in San Diego tomorrow will feature speakers with a unique perspective on nuclear power. It's billed as an alternative to a meeting recently hosted by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. KPBS North County Bureau Chief Allison St. John joins us uh, with more about this. Uh, what's different about this meeting, Allison? Well, Dwayne, the event is called uh, a seminar, and it's called the Fukushima Daiichi Nuclear Accident Lessons for California. So that gives you an idea of where the speakers are coming from. Top of the billing is Naoto Kan, who was the Prime Minister of Japan when Fukushima happened back in 2011. In fact, he's credited with intervening to prevent the Japanese company operating the plant from pulling all its employees out after the accident, possibly preventing an even worse meltdown that would have prompted the evacuation of Tokyo. So Khan spoke out in Japan last week to say the current government is rushing to resume nuclear operations without paying enough attention to safety. And who else will be speaking tomorrow? Well, another speaker is Gregory Yasko, who was head of the U.S. Federal Neg uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission. He came out to Southern California last April after San Onofre shut down in January, and he met with community groups to say he would do everything in his power to make San Onofre safe before allowing it to restart. A few months after that, he was pressured to resign from the agency, which the community groups took as a bad sign. It'll be interesting to see what he has to say at this point. Another former NRC commissioner, Peter Bradford, is also on the speakers list. And what's interesting, Duane, is that uh, San Diego County Supervisor Dave Roberts will welcome the speakers, which gives the event some political cred. Yeah. KPBS North County Bureau Chief Allison St. John. The meeting starts at 8.30 tomorrow morning in the county supervisor's chambers. More SDG&E customers may be eligible for lower energy bills because income requirements for state-sponsored programs for low-income customers have changed. Families can receive a 20 percent discount on their energy bill if they qualify. The utility says customers can find more information in their July bill. The squabble over money between Mayor Filner and San Diego's tourism agency is finally over. Filner was trying to secure funding for the Balboa Park Centennial Committee, sparking a standoff with the region's tourism board. Eric Anderson spoke with the mayor about the issues bubbling up at City Hall. Mayor, a bit of a dust-up last week between your office and the Tourism Marketing District. Uh, you released their money at the end of the week after assurances that the Balboa Park Committee was going to get their share of the tourism dollars. Are you satisfied with how things wound up? Well, I wish we didn't have to go through this stuff. It's a simple matter of them li living up to an agreement which had taken several months to negotiate. Here we have what's going to be really our top tourist attraction in the next couple of years, the Balboa Park Centennial Celebration. We're going to have a year-long national and international exposition. And they agreed to give 5% of their, of their, uh, the, this tax that uh, they collect to Balboa Park. 
but they told them they weren't going to do it. They didn't have enough money, although do they do have money for bonuses for the highly paid workers over there. But So I said, look, if you're not going to give the money, as per agreement, to Balboa Park, off the top of the money you get, then we're not, simply not going to release the funds. They agreed to do that, so I hope uh, this ends the matter. But, uh, you know, they just simply weren't living up to the agreement. One of the undercurrents that I noticed uh, as I was sitting in that tourism marketing district meeting on Friday was that there is a concern among tourism officials that the pot of money they're going to be working with could shrink. Not guaranteed, but it could shrink in coming years. What is that saying about San Diego's tourism marketplace? Yeah, yeah, well, it, by the way, this is a private group running a private effort. I don't know why the government's involved anyway. But the only reason why there's, quote, a shortage is because uh, they can't get their own hotels to pony up the, an agreement or to sign an agreement that says they are responsible for any, uh, any shortfall the city has should there be a lawsuit or should the lawsuit that's now against the, the, the uh, Tourism Marketing District be found to be valid. That is, there will be a liability to the city. We're requiring them to, that was the, the basis of our last agreement, to make up that liability. And yet they can't get every hotel to sign that waiver, we call it. And so we're withholding the money that uh, to, for any possible lawsuit problems uh, proportional to what each hotel gives. So if they can't give their own, get all their own hotels to, uh, to, to grant us the waiver, then they don't get the money. That's the only reason for any, quote, shortage. But it's not a, it's not a sign that there are fewer tourists coming to Oh, no. To in fact, Diego. all the reports I've seen is uh, the tourist economy is, is stronger now than it's been for many years and, and that the outlook is very bright. I mean, come on. This is a city that has the most perfect weather in the world, the most beautiful beaches. Uh, you know, people are going to come here. Uh, there's some question about their, how they, they use that, that money and whether they use it effectively. You know, I don't know that San Diego has a slogan, for example, after we spent hundreds of millions of dollars, like Las Vegas has, like New York has. Where has all that money gone, I would ask? So uh, they're, they're, they're whining about the money that they, they get and they don't use it effectively, they don't live up to their agreements, and then they complain somehow that tourism is going to falter. They're just wrong. Is this something that's going to happen again next year? I hope not. Uh, all they have to do is live up to the agreement that we made with them. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about Balboa Park. A big centennial celebration, not very far away. Uh, what's that going to look like? You know, I think people are going to be extremely excited. Uh, in a few weeks, we're going to roll out the first uh, set of ideas. We hired a very uh, uh, experienced, uh, uh, creative uh, firm to, uh, to, to work out all the production. Uh, a firm that has done international celebrations before. Uh, there's going to be international part of the park with pavilions that are rotating from different countries and cities around the world. There's going to be a, a place where we stress the innovation of San Diego's economy. There's going to be cultural and art events from around the world, the highest quality uh, music and art and exhibitions. Uh, I think people are going to be really, really excited. And uh, we're going to roll out those first ideas in a, in, in a couple weeks. Okay, it's going to be a, a big time for the city of San Diego. Um, a healthy city is always great to have there. The city's going to be talking about its budget uh, coming up next week. Um, are you satisfied with where you are in terms of the city's budget process? Well, clearly, uh, you know, you never have uh, enough money to do all the things a city needs. But we've turned a corner, it looks like to me. I mean, we've had six, seven, eight years of cutbacks, of uh, sacrifices, of pulling in our belts. We, ha we are on the verge of having what is called a, uh, a, a, a budget without any structural deficits. That is, our income and our spending match up without any gimmicks and one-time kinds of revenues. Uh, we have a surplus projected for, the, for, for five years out. That's why we're able to negotiate a five-year agreement with our uh, workforce. Uh, I w we're talking in City Hall now about we're arguing over how to spend the surplus or how much extra money that we might be able to give to our employees. We're not talking about cutting back. It's a lot easier, a lot uh, more optimistic to, to deal with what we're dealing with. So I'm, uh, the city council has to deal with my recommendations next week. But I'm we have a, a balanced budget. We are, we are, I asked for two things from, the, uh, from my financial people. One, that public safety be ratcheted up because we are dangerously low on police and fire protection, and we've done that. And that infrastructure, like potholes and street repairs and sidewalks, be uh, a high priority, and we've accomplished that. The highest amount of spending on that infrastructure than we've ever had. How important is it to have a city with a healthy financial balance sheet uh, when the centennial comes into town? 
Well, I think that's going to be a great you know, attraction. I mean, that is people, uh, we're going to have to spend some money to get that money. So that allows us the ability. People have confidence. There's optimism. People might say, why are you wasting money on this centennial when we can't fix our streets? It gives the city a sense that we are moving forward, that we have some confidence in our future, that there's optimism involved. So it changes the whole uh, dynamism really of a city when you have a balanced budget and you don't have to keep cutting. We're restoring library hours, restoring uh, fire stations hours, we're restoring rec center hours. Uh, I think people have a, have a better sense of what we as a city can accomplish. You are being recognized these days uh, for your efforts to kind of unify the San Diego Tijuana region a little bit. Um, where do you think you've you've really made some strides in that direction? You know, we've uh, j just a few months. Uh, uh, we were recognized on the front page uh, of the New York Times for doing that. Uh, I, I was just elected the chair of the mayors, uh, the, the 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 border mayors uh, conference that we have. Uh, so, and there's been other national recognitions or and international recognitions of what we're doing. Uh, I started with just simple thing. We put an office, a municipal office in Tijuana. It's become the center of synergies and activity. Uh, when I thought about uh, uh, submitting a proposal for a Olympics in 2024, we're going to propose the first binational Olympics in the history of the, uh, of the Olympics. Now, uh, we, that, that allows us, to, with an excitement, with a focal point, with deadlines, to say, what do we have to do as two cities to achieve something as monumental as a Summer Olympics? We have to inventory our resources, see where we can fit things together, how we can help each other, what are our obstacles, how do we make that border more efficient for... And everything then becomes in the context of this big thing in 2024. If we have to establish, for example, a, uh, a uh, athlete's, uh, what they call it, athlete's housing mm -hmm. colony, Guess what? Afterward, it could be affordable housing for our citizens. There might be some transportation improvements we have to do. Guess what? That, that stays afterward, and we have public transportation for our citizens. When we talk about a Charger Stadium, it's now in the context, could this be an Olympic venue? Could this be opening ceremony uh, kind of material? So we're going to look at things in San Diego with a new sense of, a heightened sense of both excitement and a bigger thing than what we've tried to do in the past. San Diego Mayor Bob Filner. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you us. so much. San Diego may live up to its title, America's Finest City, but a new study says it comes at a high cost. From our beaches, beautiful scenery, and year-round good weather, San Diego ranks ninth among cities with the highest cost of living. The Kiplinger study shows our rent and home costs are more than twice the national average. New York and Honolulu top the list, followed by San Francisco. State lawmakers are considering limits on how schools use suspensions for willful defiance or disruption with a look at how San Diego County school districts use those suspensions. KPBS education reporter Kyla Calvert joins us from the News Center. So Kyla, what is willful defiance and why is the legislature looking to put limits on it for student suspensions? The state defines willful defiance as disrupting school activities or willfully defying school staff's authorities. Supporters of the legislation to curb the use of this category to suspend students say it's too vague and can be used to suspend students for minor things like wearing hats in class. This is the first year that the state has published data specifically on how often schools use this as a reason to suspend or expel students. And that data shows that 48 percent of suspensions in the state last year were for willful defiance. Again, supporters of this legislation say that's just too high when you consider that being suspended even once inc increases a student's likelihood of dropping out. Los Angeles has already, Los Angeles Unified, sorry, has already voted to ban the use of willful defiance suspensions, and the bill being considered in the legislature would limit its use to middle and high school students and only after a third offense. And how often are county schools using this as a reason to suspend students? Willful defiance suspensions made up 42 percent of all suspensions in San Diego County last year, but the rates varied widely for individual school districts. In the Carlsbad, Oceanside, and Vista Unified School Districts and Fallbrook High School District, willful defiance accounted for between 50 and 55 percent of suspensions. Meanwhile, Grossmont High Schools did not use willful defiance suspensions at all, and they only made up 8 percent of Chula Vista Elementary School suspensions. In city schools, willful defiance accounted for 40 percent of suspensions. KPBS education reporter Kyla Calvert.
An Airstream mobile trailer outfitted with a recording studio is parked next to the USS Midway Museum for the next 21 days to record, share, and preserve stories from San Diego's military community. A hundred landings is a centurion. I have between two and three hundred on the Midway. Vern Jumper is a former Navy pilot who was in charge of the flight deck on the USS Midway during the capture of Saigon in 1975, ending the Vietnam War. He says those few hundred landings on the battleship were small compared to today's operations. That's not a lot. You know, a lot of guys get 11, 1,200 landings now in their career. We didn't even come close. Jumper and fellow Navy aviator Ev Southwick are sharing their experiences with StoryCorps, a national nonprofit group celebrating 10 years of gathering intimate stories from people in 50 states. Southwick remembers his time on the Midway. I was a junior officer of the watch, uh, of the underway, watch. Underway, underway, under instruction. Very good. <laughs> Story Corps brought their Military Voices initiative to San Diego because of its large veterans population. It takes about an hour to fill out paperwork, take a picture, and record your story. It will then be archived at the Library of Congress with more than 45,000 other interviews from around the country. I flew out of Miramar for 16 years. And I just, I just loved it. Joining me with further details on the StoryCorps Military Voices Initiative and how you can participate is my guest, Sylvie Lubell. Welcome. Thank you. For a bit of context, context, remind us of what StoryCorps is. Sure. So StoryCorps is a national nonprofit oral history project. We started in 2003, so we're coming up on our 10th anniversary. And... We go across the country and we record and archive the stories of everyday people. That's the big picture of it. Now, why do you think it's important to preserve oral history of what some would say ordinary American stories? Um, I think it's really valuable for a lot of different reasons, but we're preserving these stories and these memories for generations to come. So the idea is that one day your great-great-grandchildren can listen to your voice, what you experienced when you were, you know, younger. Does it add a bit more because it's the actual voice as opposed to writing it in a history book or documenting it in another way? It does. Our founder, David Isay, has a radio documentary background and preserving the voice is something that's really, really important to the whole organization. Something comes through differently when you're saying it out loud. Well, certainly some emotions you can, you can feel. Now, San Diego is one of 45 cities chosen for the uh, Military Voices Initiative, this, this special branch that's of right. this. Um, walk us through the process here at the Midway Museum. What, sure. what happens if you want to do this? Sure. So right now we are set up in front of the USS Midway Museum for three weeks. Um, we have an Airstream trailer that's outfitted with a recording studio where we invite participants to come in and share whatever stories are meaningful to them. And um, how much time? You come in, we see someone here walking into the, the Airstream uh, recording studio. How much time do they have? Do they get to sit down? and They have 40 minutes to really dive into the story. Yeah, a full 40. That... It goes by quickly. <laughs> <laughs> that seems like a long time. Will that entire 40 minutes be archived and preserved, or is it edited? Yeah, the entire 40 minutes is archived and preserved at the Library of Congress, and then we do edit a very small percent of those stories, um, which air on Morning Edition. Okay, and some of them here, this is the second year for, uh, this all started about last summer, right? Yes, in July 2012. And so some of them will actually air here on uh, KPBS. Yeah, KPBS will be getting a select stories um, so we can hear all the unique and powerful stories coming out of this stop. Right here in our in our Right here hometown. in San Diego. Now I understand that all veterans, um, service members, their families are welcome to come down and share their stories, but there's a particular interest you have in hearing from recent veterans. How come? We're really trying to close the gap that exists between the civilians and the military, so we really want to honor the voices of that one percent and maybe try to explain to the rest of the nation what it's like to be part of the service. And is it just, is it, as far as the recent returning veterans or the recent service members who are still active, 
Uh, is it because their memories are fresher? They'll give a different perspective? Yeah, I think it was really important for us to get the memories while they were fresh, but it was also really important to listen to these people who are coming home and to say, you have a space where you can sit down and share whatever is meaningful to you. And I've heard this is the first time that some of these people have actually told their story. That's true. We have gotten some, some folks who come in and after they walk out of our recording booth, they say that's the first time I was able to tell that story. So that's, that's a really tremendous power. It must have a profound impact. Do you I think, hope it does. Yeah, I wonder if there'll be any kind of follow-up on, on sort of from these people saying uh, on the impact of this. Yeah, we are doing an evaluation to see if it's more meaningful to, to veterans, and I hope it is. All right. How do you go about uh, if you want to participate in this in the next three weeks? So you can make a reservation online, or you can email us at mvi at storycorps.org. All right, Sylvie Lubao, thank you so much for talking with us tonight. And I want to let people know they can find out a lot more information on our website. The StoryCorps mobile recording booth is in the Airstream trailer parked just outside the USS Midway Museum from today through June 22nd. For more information, like I said, go to kpbs.org. When the Affordable Care Act fully kicks in next year, many people will access primary care at low-cost community clinics, but attracting doctors to those clinics is a different story. Speak City Heights reporter Megan Burke says a local health system is trying once again to change the status quo. And what's the reason for your visit today? Um, I need a refill on pain medication, and I, pretty, I think I'm due for a... Mammogram? It was in 1970, in October, and there had been um, sort of the height of the Chicano movement in Barrio Logan. The freeway had just gone through, which cut the community Costello, in half. Costello, your 830 is the waiting area. Please, Costello, 830 waiting area. Can we start over? Um, sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Finding a place at the Chase Avenue Clinic to ask Public Relations Director Jeanette Shea about family health centers of San Diego's beginnings was a little tricky. It was in October of 1970, and it was... Okay, I'll finish for her. A Barrio Logan grandmother named Laura Rodriguez took the keys for a building that was set to close, staged a sit-in, and demanded it be turned into a health clinic. It became Family Health Center's first facility. From that scrappy beginning, it's become the nation's second largest federally qualified health center, with 17 clinics throughout the county. Some of those clinics are brand new, state-of-the-art facilities. Back at the Chase Avenue Clinic in El Cajon, things are still a bit scrappy. Doctors share offices the size of walk-in closets. The conference room doubles as a break room. We're conducting our interview in a busy nurse's station. I think it's just a lot of chutzpah and that's sort of a, a characteristic of family health centers where um, we're just here to make it work. We're here to make sure our patients get access to care. And it's that chutzpah that makes clinics like family health centers a cornerstone of the Affordable Care Act, which will grow the ranks of patients by 30 million nationally. They're good at doing a lot with a little. It's been shown that we are one of the most effective and cost-efficient ways to deliver care. So if you look at the cost, it's about a third less to deliver care at a community health center setting with the same high-quality results. What they're not so good at is attracting doctors to come work for them. There are those closet-sized offices. There's also the challenge of getting med students with elephant-sized debt to go into primary care. The federal government estimates the nation is short about 16,000 primary care physicians. But Family Health Center's assistant medical director, Chris Gordon, says there's something else at work. Interestingly, literature shows that half of the physicians stay where they train. It's independent of what that setting type is. They Just half of them stay where they train. And I think probably part of that has to do with being comfortable in the environment that you learned in. And where do the majority of doctors do their residencies? Hospitals. Finding a clinic accredited for residencies is rare, but that's changing under the Affordable Care Act. The health reform law has set aside $230 million to set up residency programs in community clinics. Locally, Dr. Gordon and family health centers are leading the charge. They're applying to bring six resident physicians into their City Heights facility next year. Gordon and others are betting that if doctors start their careers in community clinics like this one, they'll stay in community clinics. That was Gordon's experience. He came to family health centers four years ago after training in Riverside County Health Clinics. I think the reason why most of us are working for family health centers is because we believe in the mission. We want to take care of the underserved. 
we're interested in assisting with bridging the gap of disparities in healthcare between those that have had insurance all of their lives and those that don't. Gordon and Jeanette Shea insist they'll be ready when the Affordable Care Act starts to close that gap next year. There might still be a doctor shortage, but family health centers started with much less, an empty building and the chutzpah of a Barrio Logan grandmother. Megan Burks, KPBS News. The federal government says Mid-City, Downtown and Southeastern San Diego have too few primary care doctors. It recommends one per 2,000 residents. Over the last several years, KPBS has delivered on our pledge to provide San Diego with quality local news and information. The best examples of this are the KPBS Evening Edition and the PBS NewsHour. From local to national, this award-winning combination of journalism featured on KPBS TV each weeknight is second to none. We take this commitment seriously. Our news team is dedicated to intelligent and thoughtful discussion. I hope you will support our expanding news efforts with a contribution right now. You can sign up to become a sustaining member with an ongoing monthly contribution or make a one-time investment in KPBS. Just go to kpbs.org or call us. And thanks for your support. Well, morning June gloom turning to a mix of sun and clouds for San Diego. Mostly overcast, though, along the coast, upper 60s through midweek. Clearing inland after the morning clouds, upper 70s. Sunny in the mountains with highs in the 80s. Desert temperatures will hit 104 the next few days. You can find tonight's stories and download the KPBS app all on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night.